And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only monk, better known as Mildred, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, the head of the upcoming Winds of Numisera project, and a, and a man who, will te who is teaching the world to either rain or hail. The one and only Morgan Rosenblum. How are you doing today, man? Doing great, Mildra. <laughs> thanks for having me on the show. Appreciate you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming on. Um, so I'll start with the. Oh, I'll start with the um, humble beginnings, as it were. Where did the writing bug? Where did the writing bug really start with you to want to try want to try and create your own fantasy stories? Um, as a, as a kid, I mean, you, you talk about like origin stories. This one goes as mm -hmm. far back as my mother's womb. Um, seriously. So my, my co-writer on this and one of my older, my, my oldest best friend, mm -hmm. uh, Johnny Handler, who's my co-writer in this and co-creator, mm -hmm. our parents actually, your mothers met in Lamaze class when they were pregnant with us respectively. So we were literally like friends before we were even born. That's what we always say. So when I say mm -hmm. womb, I'm not saying with an R, it's with a W like mm -hmm. <laughs> So, uh, you know, as children, we grew up together. We went to summer camps together. We had sleepovers together. And we were always, um, you know, playing make-believe. We liked uh, sci-fi fantasy stuff. My dad's like a big sci-fi and fantasy nut, too. And he's actually a really good reader. So when we were younger, we would have these sleepovers. My dad would, like, read us, uh, you know, Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion and um, Baba Yaga. Like, all these, like, weird short stories, long stories, all this other stuff. And it just got our, our imaginations really, like, charged up. And then... Um, we would play like this, this like make believe game where we would create our own characters, like sort of like very Dungeons and Dragons esque, but without like a board game and stuff, just kind of like around his house. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we got older, that we kind of traded that in for you know pen and paper. And then beyond that, it became like comic books. And uh, now I'm like thirty. How old am I now? Thirty five. Uh, we've been, we're, I've been working with Johnny now as uh, my partner in a company called Hero Projects for the last like five plus years, and we've. We've been making um, comic books and graphic novels for both ourselves and for like clients. So we do a lot of work with um, like musicians like Migos and uh, 311 and Shaggy and a bunch of other uh, like icons that we've turned into comic book characters and created stories around them to help, you know, bring them into new worlds. Yeah. And when now, given the. Given that Winds of Numisera is a is a fantasy comic, um, that's a that's a very interesting um, venture venture to go into, especially with you mentioning um, comic books as one, as so, as some of your inspirations. Since um, well, let's let's be honest, the American comic book market has been do has been dominated by superheroes since the um, since the Golden Age. All right. Actually, I, actually, I tell a lie. It was most that dominance was mostly during the um, Silver Age. There was there was a fair amount of horror co horror comics in the Golden Age, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, were there it were there any um, ostensibly fantasy comics that you that you could cite as in, as inspiration when it came to developing it? Um, it's a good question. I mean, the truth is, I don't know if you know this about me. I'm also an editor at Heavy Metal Magazine. You know heavy metal. Yeah, I know. So, I know. I know heavy metal. You know a bunch of their short stories, like you know Tarna and things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, that's, I would say it's a collection of of different, not so much comics per se, but just like different stories and movies even that like, uh, um, books that inspired me. So it's everything from like Lord of the Rings to Game of Thrones to video games like Dragon Age, um, and Elder Scrolls things like that. Um, like I said, Tarna as well, and. Um, even Frank Frazetta's art, like anytime you ever see like one of his amazing, you know, covers or pieces, it was it was so real. It like really brought you into that 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 scene into that space. And so, um, our it, uh, the, the inspiration pretty much comes from my upbringing, right? Like Willow, Never Ending Story, things like that. And it, uh, what I like about fantasy is, it, unlike you know superheroes per se, is that it's you, you're building an entire, it's not just like an alien planet, but it's like, it's a fantasy world, right? As opposed to just like, 
it being Earth with people that have superpowers. I mean, I'm, I like superheroes as much as the next person, but fantasy has always really spoken to me. Um, I've always just liked the whole sort of um, the idea of like this romanticism behind like sh being a knight and slaying a dragon and things of that nature. And so with Winds of Numisera, we really feel like we've crafted something unique, but um, also grounded and familiar enough where someone says, yeah, okay, that doesn't, that, that feels grounded and believable. And I, I, I can see this world being real. Um, and the characters that we've, cre we've created like an, an entire, like we built a, a whole religion and this whole history of and lore that doesn't exist, but that parallels and echoes things from like our real world um, and our history, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah. Now, fantasy is a very wide net. With one with a myriad of of sub of subgenres to to the to the point where some where somebody say, somebody saying I wrote a fantasy story ma makes me have to ask the um awkward question of okay what kind so taking that into account what style of fantasy would you say Winds of Numisera falls un under um, medieval medieval fantasy epic it's like the uh, but i think that that's a great point you just brought up which is like understanding the subgenre of it because you're right fantasy there's different kinds of there's could be like interplanetary fantasy and you know the, mm -hmm. so medieval fantasy i would say like in the vein of of like game of thrones lord of the rings dragon age is like the most um appropriate one it's got a little witcher vibes to it so would would you say that it falls more in the more in the low end of the spectrum than in the high end at first, yes. So, like the way we we introduce the series, there's not there a lot of like the the magic per se, or like the the fantastic elements, the ones that would be supernatural, are kind of like lost to myth and lore, and they're like written about. And there's like a bunch of you know traditions that people have as part of their religion that like celebrates, you know, the olden stories from the Sinigil, which is like the Numisaran Bible. Mm -hmm. And as the story goes on, like more of the magic is sort of reawakened in the world as like our main characters sort of diverge from their their you know predetermined paths and they kind of choose their own fates and as they venture off they explore more of Athera in the world they uncover some of these secrets and stories that were lost to myth and legend so it starts more on the grounded side mm -hmm. and then as it as it unfolds it 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 brings to life to light a lot more of yeah. that fantasy aspect, so it becomes more hard fantasy as it goes forward. Now, you mentioned you mentioned Game of Thrones as a point of comparison, and one of the things that it's particularly infamous for is um, having multiple character perspectives and jumping between them between chapters. Is that something th that can be expected from Winds of Numisera, or are you fo are you focused on a smaller um, set of perspectives? It's four main characters that begin our storyline. Mm -hmm. Three, three of them are um, from there's like from three different kingdoms. So mm -hmm. you have Lelia, who's the child empress. She's like this thirteen year old girl who is th thrust into the role of being an empress um, after her father dies unexpectedly, and she's the last remaining heir. And she has to rely heavily on the guidance of her high council to sort of like do what's in the best interest of her people and her kingdom. Mm -hmm. And then her childhood best friend. Krill was like her stable boy. They used to play together when they were younger, but now since Lely has become Empress, Krill is like, she doesn't have any time for Krill at all. And even when she goes riding on the horses, she doesn't even like make eye contact with him. So like their relationship is kind of gone out the window. And then, so what happens is, is that he uncovers a plot, um, some conspiracy within the, within the capital um, regarding the death of Lelia's father. And he's, he's forced to leave his only home and he meets up with like another one of the other main characters, Kelisandra, who's mm -hmm. the Baron daughter of like the North, sort of. And then there's another, there's a, a fourth character named uh, Shorsha, who is the son of the champion um, of a barbarian slash Viking hybrid uh, group or, mm -hmm. or horde, if you will, that like you know um, dwell towards the south. And so each of the pers there's really four main characters, but there's three sort of like main storylines because as I mentioned, two of the storylines or two of the characters sort of share the same story. Mm -hmm. um, and so we kind of flip between all three of those as we go forward. 
throughout the story and it bounces between the three of them, but they're all interconnected. And um, as we explore more of the world and the story goes forward, it, it they are separate, but ultimately they're part of a, a, a larger narrative. So to answer your original question, can you expect us to jump around? Yes, but not to the level that Game of Thrones does. They have so many uh, characters that it can be a little difficult to follow, um, especially for a graphic novel. We didn't want to create too many separate storylines that made it difficult to get attached to anyone. Mm -hmm. So we wanted you to, to be able to find just enough variety, right? And, and just enough uh, consistency. Yeah. Now, within the Kickstarter, you alluded to a um, series Bible, which is, some, which is something that I've um, discussed on, pre on previous shows rega regarding um, the nature of world building. Mm -hmm. Um, what, when it came to the creation of Winds of Numisera, did you end up writing that Bible about the setting first, or did you have a rough idea on, on certain, um, story threads that you wanted to do first? I think it's a combination. Um, I'll tell you this, before we do any writing ever, um, we usually start with a series Bible, like there's a template that you can look up online or, or find, whether it's for a, a TV series or for a, a comic book series or a book series, whatever it is, there's like sub genres or, or sort of little category stuff you have to like kind of fill in, which will also help you shape your world and story. It's like the genre, like you were saying, what's your genre? Okay, is it just fantasy? No, it's gotta be more specific than that. It's, you know, medieval sci-fi or it's medieval fan or whatever it may be, right? Horror, zombie apocalypse, whatever your story is. Then the next one, mm -hmm. It's like uh, comparisons. It's kind of like this, but with this key difference. Or it's kind of like this title meets this title, but set in a different time zone. We'll just, you know, something like that. And then, um, so we, we would say like, Winds of Numisera is a medieval fantasy epic, um, you know, for, for slightly mature audiences. It's less young adult. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it, it's sort of like Lord of the Rings meets Game of Thrones in that vein. And then um, you have like the log line or genre or um, short premise, which is like a you know a couple sentences or a paragraph that uh, at most that kind of gives you the overall thousand foot picture mm -hmm. of what your story be about. And then you do world like what's the world? Okay, is it a is it on Earth? Is it like a uh, you know is it like a Middle Earth, which is like some older revamped version of of what our Earth might be? Is it a completely different planet? Like where does this take place? What are the rules of your of your world? You know, does magic exist? Is it is it primarily like under building that out, and then characters understanding what you know and different cultures, things of that nature, and what the arcs are. Like, what is where does this character start in our story, and like where ultimately are they going to go, or how are they going to change, and what causes those changes and things like that. So we build out these series bibles. Um, a lot of the times, like we will have like some ideas for a scene, like you were saying, like do we just start writing it where like I always kind of envisioned there would be this cool scene like where, you know, um, the emperor was like talking to his high council and, a little, you know, his daughter is kind of walk, watching in the background or whatever it is. And like you can start with something like that as like a, as a building block, but understanding like that, where does that fit in the bigger grand scheme of things? You know, it's like if you were to have a dream, right? You can dream something like, oh, that was a cool dream. That would be cool. But like for a story that actually – has some sort of arc to it and some journey or quest. It's got to be more than just a cool, a bunch of cool scenes. Mm -hmm. uh, but the series Bible will help you really plan. It'll also help you you pitch ultimately. So whether or not you're pitching this to uh, a publisher, to you know whether it's it's a book publisher or, or a comic book publisher to get it picked up. Um, a lot of the times, like they want to see more than just like a few sample pages of your comic because they want to know where can you take it. And then mm -hmm. if you have plans than that to like take it to like a tv show or something like that down the line you'll definitely need a series bible mm -hmm. um but uh, we'd write every every single series that we come up with always has a series bible with it we yeah. just find it extremely helpful and then we wind up like for, we're actually selling a, like a modified version of the series bible so it doesn't have all the spoilers in it it's more of just kind of like a concept art book mm -hmm. that teaches you about the world the the mythology behind it, like the lore, the, the religions that we created of it, like the different cultures and and places. What and we've had all individual concept art pieces made for each kingdom, right? So it's like mm -hmm. here's Moran to the far west, which looks a little bit a little Arabian-ish, and then you have you know um, 
Benavelle, which looks a little French cathedral-like. Um, and then you have the, you know, Cien Day, which is down south and has is on, you know, in a canyon. So every place is looks different. And then we 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 love concept art. You know, has a little bit more realism to it, um, as opposed to like your traditional sequential comic art. It's cool to have both of them. And you, we post them on like both the Kickstarter, but also like the social media accounts. And you can people are like, wait, is this the same book? And it's like, yeah. One is the actual story, the comic, and the other one is like the world bible or the series bible. Both available on the Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. Now. You've mentioned it. You mentioned it being medieval, but I want to I want to try and narrow things down a little bit, especially when it comes to the tech level. And the reason why I bring this kind of thing up is, in the in the past, I have seen um, I've seen people discuss the medieval part of medieval fantasy, and put um, put something like Game of Thrones and Warhammer Fantasy Battle in this in the same conversation. Even though um, one of them is clearly based in the um, high medieval era of technology, whereas something like Warhammer Fantasy, even with its gonzoness, is rooted more in Renaissance era technology. When it comes to that particular paradigm, where would you say um, Winds of Numacera fits? Um, more on the medieval side, I would mm -hmm. say. I mean... There's no steampunk thing. Well, there's like a big, they have like a big puppet, but it's not like electronically or uh, there's like at the moment, at least when this, our story begins, there's no magically infused um, energy sources that, or, or steampunk based type of technology that, that mm -hmm. make machines work. It's all like man operated, like armor and stuff like that. We don't see actually any magic to begin with, like the high priests in the, in the high council, like, or mm -hmm. so like so the, the main lore behind the VC, but so Lelia VC, her last name's VC, mm -hmm. her bloodline, supposedly according to their Bible, right. And their religion, she's like the direct descendant of like Jonas of VC, which is like this, con this famous conqueror who at the start of time was like exploring the lands. And as he uncovered more lands, he united the territories, really just meaning he conquered them. And ultimately came across one of these like pools of essence. So in the mythology, essence is life, is like life energy. It'd be like your spirit energy, right? Mm -hmm. So when every single person and life living thing has like an energy spirit inside of them that can, when they die, it, it transfers. It either goes back into the earth or into the air, the aura, or, um, but it never just uh, disintegrates or dies completely. So supposedly when life was first sprouting and essence was abundant, it would grow into these like special condensations, these pools. And um, they were scattered all around Athera. And each pool was supposedly uh, had some sort of magical properties that if consumed, if drank or whatnot, it would give the, the drinker, the user like special abilities, right? Mm -hmm. It could be like the ability to uh, regenerate if they were hurt or perhaps everlasting life. There's there all sorts and shapes of, and forms. And each pool was guarded or safeguarded by a um, uh, what's called an essential, which is like mm -hmm. a demigod creature that all takes different forms. I'm um, sorry, I have a call coming in the background. And I don't know how to turn off my Alexa because it's my dad's Alexa. So, <laughs> no. Nope. But anyway, uh, each, so uh, the, the, the spirit or the spirit energy or this this essence and whatnot if the pools were found the, the, the story goes that jonas her great 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 ancestor mm -hmm. had stumbled upon these pools come to find the essential that safeguarded it and the the essential makes the decision of worthy or wanting and if you were found worthy you're allowed to drink from it and be gifted the special abilities and supposedly as the story goes um jonas her great 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 ancestor was bestowed the ability of, of that S pool of essence. And so, so the, the legend is that like her lineage, her direct bloodline has some sort of special blood in her that has magical powers, but like mm -hmm. no one's ever fucking seen it or anything like that. And so Lelia is of that lineage. Now you, you, um, get, you gave a bit of a glimpse of, of some of the, of some of the kingdoms that are going to be seen throughout the, throughout the story. And I'd like to, I'd like to ask a bit of de a bit of detail on e on each, and bear bear in mind I don't want you to go into anything that would be considered um, spoilery. So if, so if we get close to that line, just let me know. Well, um, I'll start with um, the imperial capital with Numa with Numacera itself. That's yeah, that's the home base of mm -hmm. the entire like story. It's the first 
well, technically it's the second kingdom we actually see in like the very opening scene you see like the Numisaran army like arriving at Moran, which is the last remaining stronghold or, or kingdom that was sort of like unclaimed. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of how the story begins. And then it cuts back to the Imperial capital where you see Lelia as like an eight year old or something like that with her um, childhood friend, Krill the stable boy at that time, kind of sneaking into the uh, the war room to like play with the figurines, mm -hmm. you know, that the, the that her father would like strategically place. And they're just like playing with toys. And as they're playing with it, it's cutting back to the real battle across the continent that Numisera is just showing that they're conquering and taking this this last um, kingdom to like make a th you know, all of the theory there is continent coast to coast, the entire continent. Yeah. Um, what can you tell me about Marin? Moran, it's Maron. pronounced. So, so Moran is there. There, um, this is a race of people called the Maranim. They're mm -hmm. um, kind of liken them almost to like um, old Jerusalem to a degree, where uh, the scion of 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 Moran is like this ancient um, special. It's almost like an oasis in a desert to a degree. Mm -hmm. Um, or in these dry lands to the far west. And they're the people that inhabit them, the Maranim, are like these cat-looking people. So have you ever seen or read like Island of Dr. Moreau? It's kind yes. of like kind of like that. So they all they're not like just a cat head on like a a human body. They kind of look somewhere like in between that. So it you know it, it, they have a little bit more human-esque type of faces, but they still have those like feline features, um, which is pretty neat. And so what, what's one of the cool things about the story, though, is that like we we talk about them a lot, but you don't actually get to see them up close for like uh, until chapter six in the graphic novel, which is cool. Like that's a very cool part in the story where we've been following these three different storylines and we've talked about Moran a bunch and they mentioned the cat people, but we've yet to see one up close. And then chapter six begins as like a flashback to the battle or like it switches perspective to the Maranim when Numisera first took like that, that their castle and their lands. Yeah. It's pretty neat. Now, Dana Vale, the no the uh, northern province. Now just from the image that you that you've shown seems to ha seems to have a bit of a I guess go I guess gothic approach with yeah. this architecture. Oh. No, I like that you picked up on that. Yeah, it, it was it was something that dawned on me right at, right after you right after you said that Moran um, is comparative to old Jerusalem, whereas Dana Vale I'm I'm seeing <clears throat> a lot of um, a lot of Gothic era um, Western Europe. Yes, I I think that I mean it's to a combination. We don't want to ever just take mm -hmm. like one. Even when I said like you know Moran was like uh, old Jerusalem, it's mm -hmm. it's also got aspects of Africa to it and things of that as well. Um, but uh, with Denevale, it's like kind of like French-ish. They're, they're supposed to be like the North, so they're a little bit more rugged. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, like the when we're, when we're building these kingdoms and we work with the artists on it, uh, we talk a lot about like, okay, well, what is, the, what is the culture like there? What are the people like? What do um, they're built? Like what does the architecture primarily consist of? Is it, is it very like, concrete base and stone is it more metal is it is it you know mosaic tile so we we talk about all of this kind of stuff a lot of detail and work goes into that um it's colder up there it's mm -hmm. more rugged we came up with like i don't want to necessarily say like they're not the words type thing that like game of thrones has like where everyone has like a saying but there mm -hmm. are certain like um there are either some sayings or just like some quotes or something that we put at the beginning of, of the series Bible and at the beginning of each kingdom, there's like a cool little thing that we quote, whether it's something one of the characters spoke in the storyline or it's a saying that they use or some like a uh, cool mm -hmm. to a song that maybe they sing. And we show that's that kind of encapsulates what the culture is about. So um, Numisera is kind of like ancient Rome to a degree. Mm -hmm. um, Catholic Church because their religion of Sinesia and their Bible, the Synagil, they like constantly spread that and push that and tell the story like, you know, Numisera means the one true kingdom as ordained by the gods kind of thing. So like mm -hmm. join us and let us and be part of our our empire at this point and you know you'll you'll have peace for generations. And so Denevale used to be its own kingdom with a king who is now a baron. And in order to sort of you know, preserve the safety of his own people. The uh, the once king of Denevale, um, Edgar Wissengrad VI, 
decided to uh, bend the knee to Prothis VC Lelia's late father um, to save his, his people. And in doing so, he relinquished his title as king and is now the Baron, right? So mm -hmm. like in the story, when we see him, he's like, he travels to, to New Messera capital and like other people like still kind of like accidentally like bend the knee and bow to him because he was once their king. And they're like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, your grace, I mean, my Lord, I forever forget your station has changed. So it's like cool little subtext and, um, to, to kind of like hint that like, oh, he was once a king, but not anymore. And so that means his daughter, which would have been the princess, Kelisandra, is now the Baron's daughter. Um, and she cares less about the fact that she can't be princess. What she cares more about is that she'll never be able to like be a knight and a soldier in like the army because in Numisaran law, women are prevented from being soldiers and knights. And that's all Kelisandra wants. So that's like kind of her story. Ah. Now, when it comes to Kuna Resil, which I'm hoping I got that right. Yeah, you did. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, You're getting all this from the camera? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, right. Yeah. Um, now, when, now, obviously, with now with the art, I know that I know that that's gonna that's going to raise the eyebrow of one of uh, one of my colleagues because of his love for airships. But mm -hmm. so that's Final Fantasy inspired to a degree. Um, there's a few inspirations for that one. Yeah. But uh, so they're actually, full disclosure, we don't get into their storyline until like the very end of book one, like mm -hmm. of the graphic novel one. You just get to meet them at the end of them. But what we, what you know, this, and this information is in the, the series Bible that we plan on making public. Like this mm -hmm. part won't be edited out, for example, because we're fine with people knowing about the different cultures. Um, the the Nai, which is what the people of Kunari still are from. So they're long, slender. They've got these like winding horns that go over their their heads. They're extremely intelligent as a species, but they're also um, they they kind of come with one shared defect or or flaw in their people, and that is that they have a difficult time reproducing, and that more more times than not they either die in childbirth, right, which means mm -hmm. they can only have one child, or they are unable to create a child beyond one, like their their system shuts down beyond that. So that makes them a very, very delicate species. So they live up in the mountains above pretty much the rest of the world um, in what's called the sky reach, where like because they're long slender frames, they're able, they're more agile, they can climb, they can jump, things like that. Kind of, you know, like a mountain gazelle to a degree, mm -hmm. hybrid. And, um, but because they're also super intelligent, every single member of their society is extremely important and contributes. Um, so like there's really no uh, poverty with them hmm. because everyone is valuable and contributing to it. And um, one of the main characters from that storyline, she's got a long name, but uh, for short, she goes by V, like V-E-E. -E. Mm -hmm. uh, and V is, is this huntress who really just has this this curiosity to explore the world below that you know that she's been told is like dangerous and not for her kind because you know like the people of Numisera are you know treacherous and and want to take everything that's not, isn't theirs and they'll tell you anything so she ultimately winds up coming across some weary travelers from the south when she's exploring you know going outside of her range which is pretty cool and that's how we bring that storyline in now, see now, um, Sia Da, which again I'm hoping. Yeah, I know it's a... hard to pronounce. It's it's just Sia Day. Yeah, Sia Day. Um, but it's got a bunch of extra vowels and apostrophes and stuff. Um, with cert, I I associate certain apostrophes in like with cert with certain with certain um, with cert with certain tones, and that and that's the that's what threw me off for a second on that, um. When it comes to that area, the throat, I'm guessing that's located more to the south. Yeah, that's correct. Mm -hmm. There's a map. It's I'm probably hard to see on the uh, the Kickstarter right now because it's a small image, but it's also like in the the graphic novel. I think mm -hmm. it's like one of the first few pages, just yeah. so that you can, if you ever wanted to like flip back to be like, where are we now? Mm -hmm. Like you can see it. I think it's fun. That was a, a really fun process too, just like literally designing the map and where things were. But the, um, that they, they call their home base the throat. It's a settlement that is mm -hmm. literally carved into the canyon cliffs, and uh, it's this narrow passage way in between these like two gigantic canyons. So it's like very well fortified. There's only one like 
one way in and one way out or technically mm -hmm. two ways in front and back and then it's like super high up so in between so it'd be very difficult to take their lands but the what we find out so they're like a warrior based tribe mm -hmm. where there isn't the only the, they have what's called a champion that's essentially their monarch but it's determined by being this, this the best fighter kind of like dothraki to a degree mm -hmm. where like uh, you can challenge the the sitting champion for right of champion um but if you lose your dead like if there's no yielding you you have to do it to the bat, um to the death and so whenever the 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 sitting champion is challenged like if they lose then the the right or the right of champion and like therefore the right to command the clans um and the hordes falls under the new champion what's cool though is you can't pass your title to like your next of kin so like if you get old and or and die like it's not like your son or your daughter takes over it's like it someone would what usually ha always happens is as the um the 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 champion grows older and becomes slightly weaker someone will challenge him at that point to mm -hmm. take it from him but when the story begins Cleese sarai who's like the most badass champion that's ever ruled he's the only one to have taken it from his own father which means he challenged his own dad for it killed him in the right of combat and then now is sitting and so now he's actually trained he has three sons um ardim Phasia, and sorsha mm -hmm. who he's trained to do be do the same yeah. right and so the main character in the CN Day storyline, because they're called CN Day, is like mm -hmm. the type of people they are. See a day is their place, and the throat is their capital. Mm -hmm. um, so the youngest son, like, is very like against the traditions of their people. He feels they're outdated. Their lands are dying. They're drying up, and they keep um, sending like uh, the hordes across the continent, like this narrow pathway called the the permafrost, which is like this icy marsh glacier territory mm -hmm. where to to like go and raid the new Masaran villages and things like that and then take you know resources back but it's becoming more difficult to traverse that permafrost as of late because the lands are you know global warming whatever it's like drying out mm -hmm. and um the youngest son Sorsha is like we need to move to a new home and the father's like you can do whatever the hell you want once you're champion if you ever make a champion until then like shut up I'm I call the shots kind of thing mm-hmm now, what you'll find out, and I don't know if I want to say this or not. I won't say it. <laughs> um, they, their lands have a secret that they don't even know of. Ah. Like, they're sitting on something they don't even know. Mm -hmm. um, um, the next one I wanted to ask is on Teras Mina. Teras Mina. Mm -hmm. Another um, group that we only get to meet at the very end of. Like, there's... Um, as I mentioned, this is a big series. So, like the first graphic novel is like two hundred twenty-ish pages. Mm -hmm. um, that that we don't even get to meet every single kingdom that I show off there. Yeah, um, I think we meet most of them right at the end. But um, the Terras Mina, they're they're kind of like your you know your Amazons, Amazonians. Mm -hmm. The um, got a little like Wonder Woman vibe to it. So they're all mm -hmm. female um, warriors, and they they travel to the mainlands like every seven years to grab um men and uh, to procreate and you know keep their 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 nation and country going but they purposefully don't care to learn the language of the mainlanders because they want to keep their you know their prey or their those other people that they're you know taking from their home poaching from their homes like mm -hmm. completely alienated and separate All right um and when it comes to june um like now, I've, that's that's the one place whose architecture is going to stick out from the from the rest, like a like a proverbial sore thumb, <laughs> mm -hmm. on um, purpose too. Yeah, and I'm get I'm guessing I'm guessing much like with some of the other nations, June is one that will be rep will be referenced near the tail end, but it's not one that's going to be seen in the in the first volume. So we're still playing around. We're going to see like how. So we've outlined the entire first mm -hmm. book so far. We've written about half of it. And mm -hmm. like the art takes a lot longer, like the sequential art takes a lot longer to execute than the writing part of it. Like Johnny and I, since we've already outlined it, the the actual writing and comic script form is, is not nearly as, as time um, sucking as uh, as doing the artwork, right? So mm -hmm. 
we're going to find out as we continue to move forward exactly how much room we have left. We've been playing around with the idea of throwing like a, a kicker scene, like post credit kicker scene in to kind of introduce June mm-hmm. properly or, or if we're deciding if we're just going to wait for the beginning of the next, um, the second graphic novel, which we feel very confident we'll get to. The Kickstarter mm-hmm. was a lot more successful than we had initially anticipated. Mm-hmm. Um, we're obviously very happy about that. But one thing you'll notice in the map is that we f- there's like one continent that mm-hmm. we clearly focus on, but then there's this thing called the Great Divide, which is literally just this gigantic ocean. Mm-hmm. And then we act purposefully throw just a tail of another continent, just barely in view, that no one that we know of from the main continent, right? Um, from the Numisaran side of, of Athera ha- knows about. So like the, the thing about the Great Divide is that s- sailors and travelers always like kind of ship out to go ex- in exploration to the east, but they never come back. Mm-hmm. Or if they come back, you know, they, some come back, but like they're like, we couldn't find anything. We turned back as we were like halfway through our supplies, right? And didn't want to just keep going. They didn't know how far to keep going. But what you'll ultimately find out, and this isn't so much a spoiler, is something you probably anticipate is that there is another entire continent, mm-hmm. the Eastern continent, and that has like kind of um, Asian influences to it. Like I said, a lot of the stuff that we did with our world building echoes our current one. Um, and then a totally different set of lore over there. Mm-hmm. And when I say totally different, there's like there's definitely some similarities. You're going to find out that like, oh, some of the truths that Numisaran had in their, in their Bible is also shared similarly across the seas. But um, that storyline really is the part where you start to reawaken some of the... Uh, the magic stuff because it seems as though on that continent that magic is a lot more alive which is pretty cool mm-hmm. and when it comes to soul gill the forgotten mm-hmm. keep um now what now obviously for obviously for me the um the artwork for the artwork for it um very much reminds me of of the uh, wall of the wall to the north um Especially given that it's in a frozen wasteland, and I'd know a thing or two about frozen wastelands. Mm. Um, is is it more of a, is it more of a place where is it more of a situation where the um, keep is maintained but wa- but far off from civilization, or is it a case where it's um, where it's largely a ruin? It's kind of it's like a mystical castle that seems to like be unfindable, except for when you get lost in the cold in like the great white north so like there's no wall and like wild lands per se to the north it's just so cold it's like no one really there's not a lot of things going on up there mm-hmm. once you get past like so north of den vale, which is like kind of one of the more northern actual kingdoms beyond that is just what's called the great white north there's no wall there's no like oh there's there's tales of mystical anything it's just like it's all mountain and cold and there's not really any reason for us to try to like uh, beyond, just so you know, beyond even like furthest north, that's where you find like above the mountains, above the cold is where the Kunari Sil people, um, mm-hmm. where Kunari Sil is and the Denai people are. But um, and that's all shown on the map. But like Soljil is like this this forgotten keep. It's mystical. It's magical. Um, there's one person that seems to be living in the keep, um, who is this, this character called Obelisk, and he's like this elderly knight. Very much. Have you ever seen like um, Indiana Jones and um, yeah, is it like the third one? I always forget the, the name. Last is that Crusade. the Last Crusade, right? With like the Holy Grail. Do you remember the old mm-hmm. knight from that? Yeah. So he was a big influence over this, and a big inspiration over this um, one character. We we've always liked the idea of there being like this freaking old knight. Is he just really old, or is he like actually immortal? Is it like what is this character? And he's like kind of creepy, but also inviting. And he's like, come in from the cold. Let me warm you by the fire. And then he explains to you that there's like this uh, this labyrinth inside of this castle, which is magical. And if you can get to the center of the labyrinth, it's called the Necros. Mm-hmm. It unlocks the, your greatest desires and and treasure that you could ever possibly imagine. And so he tries to, you know, wh- wh- so your options are either go back out into the cold, right? And try to find your way home. And like, because you're lost at this point, you only find the castle when you're lost. Or take your chances in in the labyrinth, and then you can get home. You can you can get everything according to this. So I'll just leave it at that. But that's that's what the forgotten keep of Soljil is. Obelisk. Pretty cool part of the story, though. Yeah. Now that you part one in uh, book one, 
Yeah. Which is... Now, you already mentioned about, um, about essence. Um, as well, and, and the, as well as the, um, essentials. Um, could you go into a bit of the, fir of the first ones, which I'm guessing would be one of the ma one of the major equivalents to a pantheon within the lore? Yeah, there, so the first, uh, initially when, when the world first began, mm -hmm. as was like growing like essence became trees it became oceans it became mountains and things of that nature it just became it was life right mm -hmm. imagine like a star or a sun was just being like glowing essence like a big portion of it when a planet was born or something like that like essence started to become physical things and take different you know um mm -hmm. manifestations and things like that so it grew into like these gigantic moving beings that are, are like titans or gods that are referred to as the first ones and they they look kind of like gigantic moving mountains and um a big inspiration for that was like sort of like shadow of the colossus mm -hmm. right? these like gigantic moving slow moving like creatures that could almost like become the earth to a degree so what happens mm -hmm. is is that as, as essence was growing and as they were creating more life the things that the the, the first ones could create because they had powers of the gods ultimately or were the gods they would create like uh, animals and and men and people and all this other stuff and from that they it just life just kind of grew on its own at that point mm -hmm. so they realized like okay we don't we can we're using up our powers we let's go to sleep for a while for slumber and let our our energy just kind of be and so they like uh, these gigantic mountain looking creatures like kind of like crawled into the earth and became a mountain or became a forest or these giant things which is neat. So like they've resi they've resided a slumber, but before doing so, they they left these like pools of essence, like I said, around, hidden and scattered amongst Athera, and then gave like a, created like a demigod creature called an essential to safeguard it to make sure that like, they were protected, and only the worthy were allowed to to consume those pools if discovered, mm -hmm. and then so the the first these are this is again it's all part of the 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 Sinigil and the, the Sinitian lore, the religion, but we start to see like how much of it is actually true. And like, oh, was what about obelisk and soldier? Is this Necros, is that connected to, are they all connected to the same lore? Mm -hmm. Is it all about essence? Is that what the source of magic is? And I'm not gonna answer that question, but yeah. that is like what kind of one of the biggest pieces of the, the story is. Yeah. and. When it comes to jo when it comes to jo when it comes to um, Jonas, the uh, effectively the founder of um, the, the Numacera Empire, mm -hmm. um, I'm cur I'm curious if there and if there are any um, historical figures that served as inspiration for him. I think like any original like conqueror from like Alex the Great to like. Just like th throughout time, we've had many conquerors. He mm -hmm. represents every single one of them, I would say, to a degree. You know, like Attila the Hun, like any great conqueror. It, it, it's Timur. the equivalent storyline. What's that? Timur. Sure. Yeah. I, well, that's that's one of the ones that that always come always comes up for me because of the amount the amount of land that he that he ended up getting the amount of land that he ended up getting and. The fact that he had taken that um, he had taken out one tenth of of the known world's population at, during his reign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't even know that that was that that high of an amount of. But that's the that's mm -hmm. the whole point. But he's also like so the biggest theme of the story, and it's the mm -hmm. first quote we we open with in the graphic novel. I think it's the first like written word part of the story, which is like history. And this is a Winston Churchill quote, I believe, mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter because it applies for everything. Which is history is written by the victors. Mm -hmm. Um, meaning that like those who ultimately conquer can dictate the narrative and make themselves and frame themselves in the history books however they like. So the biggest theme of the story is like, did this story, like, so the story goes that Jonas was found the pool, was weighed by the essential, the creature that was safeguarding the pool and found worthy, mm -hmm. right? Was uh, permitted to drink from it and such gained you know these incredible powers supposedly and was blessed and ordained by the gods ultimately right mm -hmm. and that's the story that everyone's drank up no pun intended yeah. um so it's like that it did that happen and like as you read through the story there's like a pretty cool like like we'll start to see what really happened mm -hmm. um 
and one one of the th- one of the things that I ke- that I kept noticing is I looked through the Kickstarter page and see the um um symbol that you have that you have on the cover is mm-hmm. the is this notion of a um of a th- of a three circled um sigil um did you get did you guys intent did you guys intentionally put some degree of importance on the number three? Um, yes and no. So because the story, like I said, kind of follows three different storylines, mm-hmm. right? So we were playing with four was one of the big ones we were doing. If you look at the logo and this is really what we, we spent a lot of time like building this logo, redoing it and just getting it just right. It's actually Johnny's wife, Jen Beaton, who, um, now John, Jen Handler, who, uh, helped us like perfect it. She's like, oh, you should combine this one and this one. We're like, I don't know. And then we did and we're like, oh my God, that works. But what it is ultimately is it's it's three swirling winds and like the tail is supposed to look like three different directions kind of like swirling together. Mm-hmm. Uh, winds of Numisera, the reason it's called that is supposed to be like change of direction, change of power, influence, change of influence, just that like um, the swirling winds of politics and of you know, conspiracy and of just of the shift in power and regime is is meant to be symbolic in that. Um, the notion of three, we there like I said, we follow like even though there's four main characters, two of them are sort of joined at the hip for the vast majority of the story. Mm-hmm. So it's really three main narratives that we follow. So like on the cover of the book, which we've we've re, we've kind of taken the the main sigil logo for Winds of Numisera, and we've mm-hmm. like used it as a backdrop, and then put like uh, one of the main characters of each one inside each of this uh, those circles to kind of like emphasize or or convey that it's like there's three stories that we follow. Mm-hmm. And as the story goes on, you know, like we'll introduce more storylines. Like there'll be new characters, just like any good story does, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that will take on a central role. Certain characters that we've fallen in love with may die. You know, um, we have to have that risk there for you to really care. Otherwise, it's like everyone's always safe there's no stakes yeah and when it comes now i will i will admit that um that that um sorcia and I, i'm so and don't worry i'll get i'll get it right eventually it's just it's just a lot, a right. lot of a lot of pronunciations to take in there's but, just so you know too there's actually we mm-hmm. on purpose we added a uh to to the series Bible, there's mm-hmm. a pronunciation guide every time we first introduce a person, and then there's a glossary. So it always says like how to phonetically pronounce it. Yeah, but I am I will I will admit that give, given the given the um the com- comparison, um, I am interested in if if um if they oper- if they operate on an on a very external. Um, based honor system. In what sense? Like, can you give me a specific? Um. Well, this this was some this is something I t- I talked about a long time ago because when um when some when someone had someone had asked me how is it that Klingons can can talk can talk so much about honor and yet they use stealth systems. Oh uh, yeah. Um. And my and my response was that they that they do but you're think but the honor that you're thinking of is the inter is the internal style that is far younger than the uh, classical concept is um as with with a lot with a lot of external honor it's in two forms um horizontal and vertical um horizontal being your um your actions and adherence to the uh, gr- to the group and vertical being your personal achievements within the group so to address that that's really cool so we actually came up with like a pledge it's almost like a chant or a, they call it a plain song mm-hmm. that, that when when someone is ready to pledge themselves to the horde and this is in the first book which is pretty mm-hmm. dope um they have to, they sort of recite this and it's recited back to them. So the first person says, since all who live were born to die, I'll show no fear and tell no lie. I'll make my faith and take what's mine. And then they all say together and greet the gods when it's my time. Mm-hmm. So when you talk about honor, yeah, they're not supposed to lie. It's like they're caught lying. It like, it devalues 
who they are. Mm -hmm. um, they're supposed to be fearless, you know, yeah. um, brave, and um, make and the, the, you know they're because they're marauders, they're they're pillagers, right? They're raiders. Mm -hmm. They like one of the lines as I I'll reiterate it says I'll make my fate and take what's mine. So if you how do you make your own fate? Well, possession you can you know it's like well it's only yours until someone takes it from you, which again is another big theme, right? History is written mm -hmm. by the victims. It's like it's only yours until someone takes it. And if you think about like primitive more primitive cultures, and and even like animals, right? Lions and and predators, right? It's like the ones that are the strongest get to have the best mate and get to have the best like you know grounds they'll piss on things to claim it like mm -hmm. there's that primitive part of it but honor is important to them and that's also why it's like well if you're going to die you die in the battlefield and then you get to meet the gods yeah. so it's got that you know it's got the valhalla vibes the barbarian aspect of it but then there's also some like some knight aspect to it you know yeah now uh, and sorsha is very like which you'll see right off the bat when we first introduce their culture, we've we've heard about them from the Numisaran perspective as like these, you know, barbarian type and like, you know, being just brutal and all that. And the first character we meet is Sorsha, who's like the exact opposite of his people. Mm -hmm. He's very cerebral. He's very meticulous and calculating and doesn't seem to care too much for violence or for taking things that don't actually belong to him. Mm -hmm. um, and he wants to change the ways of his people, but the only way he'd ever be able to do this would be to, you know, be the best warrior and he's sort of the runt even though he looks pretty strong you know compared to numiserans com mm -hmm. and compared to his own other people he doesn't seem particularly threatening yeah and when um i th when it come when it comes to when it comes to the when it comes to their particular um pan when it comes to their particular pantheon um I'm guess I'm guessing that part that part of the part of the reason that there's this um that there's this description of the, of them being the, being well barbarians even though even though on one level on one level it's a it's accurate is the is um the fact that their particular approach with the gods is not the one that the that the rest of the world follows. Yeah, we don't even know. Like it's not um they're like at the point in the story, like you don't mm -hmm. get to see like what their version of gods. Like, you'll find it out later that they have it, but theirs is different. Um, yeah. They like very different. Like they believe in gods of like the different. It's a very different system as far um, as the religion. A they very, believe in uh, like, polytheistic one. Yeah, there's. I mean, well, keep in mind though. So is so is Numiseran. Like mm -hmm. Numiseran still believes in like the first ones. It's it's you have to understand. There's like a it's a reshaping of the term gods. There is no one God Almighty. There's like they believe in essence is ultimately life energy. Life energy first formed as these first ones, which were these titans or mm -hmm. gods that could create more life. They then created the pools of essence as like gifts for anyone who could find it and conquer enough, right? Mm -hmm. And then, uh, but there was a guardian over each one that had to make the decision for them as like their standing, you know, like. Like you're gonna fill in for me while I'm residing in slumber. So the question too is like, are if these first ones are sleeping, will they ever wake up? Mm -hmm. Right. That's like another part. But it's all polytheistic. There's multiple gods for everything. But the I think the point is is that Numisaran religion and lore is very different from the CN day ones. Um, they don't. I don't even think they they believe in essence or know of what that is. They don't have that in their storybooks. Mm -hmm. Um, and when, when it comes now, again, we don't even know, like when I say we, we as an audience don't even know if essence is actually real at all either. Yeah. We, we have, we don't see it. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's just the Bible, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, Oh, well, the old Testament, it said that. So. Yeah. When, and there was one paragraph when it came to the description of Jonas that, um, that, uh, that I wanted to, fo I wanted to focus on and that being, the the um holy duty to uni to unite um to unite the continent under a single banner yeah, yeah. It, again and that has to do with like the play on words of uniting versus mm -hmm. conquering yeah and when it com when it comes to when it comes to that is is that so is that something that's that's Implied to be implied to be expected of whoever of whoever happens to be ruling the empire. What's that? Can you repeat the question? Um, is it impl is it implied that 
the um, that the next ruler is to is to carry on that particular task. Good question. I, yeah, I would think so because it's like part. It's the mission of the, like you'll hear it spoken a lot mm -hmm. of. So like the the main issue, I guess, when Pro, when we first meet Prothos, who's alive when the story begins and then like dies five years later. But um, and that's not spoiling anything. That's like given away in the trailer. Um, but he, he talks about like, you know, when, when Jonas, my great ancestor first did this, it was the dream and the, the mission to unite the entire continent under a single banner. And like, we're still not there yet. So I'm going to like, we've still my, you know, my grandfather and his grandfather and his father before him, like they've all been trying to do this and he wants to finish it and yeah. he gets really close. But what happens is, is that Protus gets overzealous and overcommitted pretty much and like spreads himself too thin. Mm hmm himself open for like other territories to now fight back like the north and the south and things like mm -hmm. that um and so five years later he's now gone and lalia is like thrust into power while the the even though it's the the numacera is the biggest like map wise that it's ever been it's also like the the most vulnerable it's ever been because because of the fact that it spreads so it spreads so thin it spreads so thin. So like what Prothus kept doing is he would take a place and then he's like like imagine if you were playing a board game, tabletop mm -hmm. game, and you're like like a risk or whatever it may be, and like you're yeah. keep you you win something, and then instead of like fortifying what you have, you're like let's keep going, let's take like okay now we have fifty percent of our former army, well let's move them west and grab the next place, and then it's like okay well but you haven't left enough people back to fortify what you had before, mm -hmm. so that's kind of like in a dumbing down situation what happened, yeah, um. And and um, what pro and what probably does what probably doesn't help matters is that based well, on the way, how based on how you another I have another call coming in soon okay. so I've just giving you heads I thought we were doing this for like an hour and we're like right around that yeah so uh, so sorry about that sorry about no, that no I should have let you know I yeah. just looked at the time right now um well take taking that into taking that into account now the um ki now the Kickstarter is gonna is gonna be finished in a in a couple days. Um, what do, what are you seeing as far as a release window for the, for the, um, volume? For the whole book? So that's a good question. Like we're planning for like August, I think realistically, um, to finish it, the whole thing. But we were, I think what we're going to do, um, yeah, like, so the first two chapters are like pretty much fully finished right now. Mm -hmm. Um, cause we had already, we had already had the first issue done when we launched the campaign that was like what we used to show off the uh, the project mm -hmm. the entire series bible was done and then we had we had preemptively gotten started on the next book um so that we didn't like lose valuable time so now like with that whole book pretty much done we just need a little proofreading some fine tuning some stuff and then do a few test prints that mm -hmm. that the first two chapters of the eight could potentially go out like um as early as february that's what we said but like uh, we because we've hit our, our some stretch goals, we've made it to these uh, the ha first half, like the first four chapters. That could probably get done around like May, mm -hmm. and then um, or a little bit before that. So uh, between it's between like August and uh, October or November, like a full year from now is like realistically when the entire book will be fully like all eight chapters will be available, and we're going to also explore, you know. Um, publishing through like a, a major publisher as opposed to just doing it independently for, you know, to partner up with like a legitimized publisher, you know? All right. I kind of, mm -hmm. Yeah. No, just like you kind of, you hopefully like they'll see the success of like mm -hmm. the campaign and, and what we've built so far. So we'll see. And then the other thing, this kind of actually, I think um, segues really well into you know, what you primarily talk about, which is like, I was talking with Johnny about, you know, this would, we feel like this IP, this story, this world we've built and characters would be great for a tabletop game. So that's something that we're going to look into um, bringing it, adapting it into as well. Well, that's, uh, that's obviously some, obviously something that I'd, I'd be keeping a close eye in, on if that happens. Yeah. Um, but with that, with that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the, for taking the time to, out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity at play. I love it. Thanks and for having me. Anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> All right. You got it. Appreciate you. And of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. 
And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your one and only monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!